Bonsoir, Madame Monsieur, or good late afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Apprenticeship of Evil, a special artist talk with Denison Ramalho. This is our closing day, or closing night as it may be, or closing dusk, <laughs> where we are now. Uh, and this seems like the most fitting final panel to do in our 2020 edition. Uh, as a tribute to the great Jose Mojica Madins, who so many of us adored. Uh, Mujik has been to Fantasia multiple times. He won her Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, so many Mujika stories. Uh, but who better to tell them than Denison, who grew up loving the man's work uh, and managed to work, become a collaborator of his uh, and, and blossom out into, into a very, very distinctive artist in his own right. Uh, Denison, of course, uh, directed in 1998 the short film Nocturno. Uh, first came to Fantasia in 2003 with Amor Sado Mai, Love for Mother Only, uh, which was later distributed on the Small Gauge Trauma DVD the Synapse Films put out and may still be available in some places. Of, I don't know. Uh, I still see it listed occasionally. In 2011, uh, he made the incredible short Ninjas, which world premiered at Fantasia. Uh, in 2014, he contributed a segment, one of the strongest segments, I would say, to the second ABCs of Death film. J is for Jesus. And in 2018, we, were, we world premiered his feature directorial debut, The Night Shifter. And of course, in the parenthesis to all of that, he was the co-writer and many other things on Mujica's comeback film, Embodiment of Evil. Uh, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you a leading, a leading and visionary voice in Brazilian fantastic cinema, Denison Ramalho. Welcome, Denison. Hi, Montreal. Hi, world. Uh, hey, this is available worldwide. No geo-blocking on the artist talks. Yeah, man. Like, I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm folding the space-time continuum because I am home in Brazil, but I'm at the same time at my home away from home, which is Fantasia. So, <laughs> yeah, man. It's like ubiquitous. Like, <laughs> Well, that's cool. I'm ha happy to bring some happiness. You know? I, mean, I know that uh, it's been difficult out there to put things mildly. Yes, 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 yes. Well, I'm so glad to be here, man. So glad to be here with you all. Uh, it's it's our pleasure. Um, so where to begin? I mean, maybe with, maybe with your, your childhood, your, your first experience encountering Mojica's work. Uh, wow, that's, that's, that's a long way back. Right? I know. Uh, that would that, that would be 1978 uh, when I was like a five year old kid, and uh, <laughs> I wish I could have learned about that type of cinema when I was five. I, yeah, I was in my late teens; it was in the early 90s when I first saw a Mojica film. I think that would that, that that was a landmark because I would say that my interest in horror films began uh, uh, with that one moment. Uh, Mojica used to host a TV show. Uh, it's called O Show do Outro Mundo, which means the show from another world. Mm -hmm. it, played, it played late night on Saturdays at a, a major uh, uh, channel here in Brazil. And uh, I never saw an episode, a, a single episode of uh, uh, O Show do Outro Mundo. However, I did see the announcements that played in the afternoon. And uh, just seeing Mujica in the announcements was enough to terrify the bejesus out of me. I remember, you know, the, the figure in the long cape and the top hat and the huge fingernails. And uh, uh, um, he would like, it was just an announcement for tonight's show. And usually this little snippet was Mujica telling the last portion of the horror story that he was going to tell that night. <laughs> And it was delivered like were they delivered in classic Zeta Kai show style monologues? In, in the yeah. sense of where it'd be poetic and it would be all these interesting musings as well as talking about some kind of a narrative story. Yeah, I think you no, know, I, I think he short he shot some short films, you know, uh, to, to be told as horror stories during the show. But uh, 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 but in these little announcements, it was just an orally told story. So I remember he saying something like that and uh, decides that uh, and after all Cla Claudio Miro's attempt to keep her dead, Olivia came back to life. 
And when I saw those fingernails, it, I, I freaked out. I had to sleep with my lights on for, for, for many nights. Uh, and that was pretty much that, that that's where it started. Mm -hmm. Only many years later, uh, uh, during the days of VHS, I was able you know, to find some of his films. And it was an epiphany when I saw them. What was the first one you got to see? And I, I, at Midnight or Digger's Soul. So you started chronologically right at the beginning. Well, there was no chronology because you know not, not all of these films were available. Like oh, know, I see. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Because my entryway, my gateway drug to Mojica's world was Embodiment of Evil through Mike Graney's something weird VHS cassettes at the time. Uh, I saw that strange world, and then finally the third one I saw was the first one at midnight, and then I saw this Night of Possessor Corpse uh, and Exorcismo Negro and all the other great ones, Strange but, Lost Naked Pleasures, which I love. But when I found At Midnight, I'll Take Your Soul, uh, it spoke to me emotionally, it resonated in me because it made me remember uh, like these very shabby amusement park rides that we have in these, you know, these very shaky, uh, uh, dingy, uh, uh, like neighborhood amusement parks in Brazil. I used to go like, you know, to, 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 to go train, you know, the, these little rides. And uh, I, said, I said, look, I'm seeing that on film and it really terrifies me. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that the day I saw at Midnight Taker, so they changed my life. It was could imagine. It was a game changer for me, and I and I wasn't into filmmaking. I was just a horror film fan. You know, mm -hmm. I, I like Hammer films, and then I started you know, like like going after Mojica like crazy. Um, and uh, I, and I remember I lived in South Brazil. Mojica lived in São Paulo. He lived he lived in São Paulo all his life. And uh, I used to, I, I'm a metalhead, I have always been, will always be, and uh, I used to come to Sao Paulo uh, in my late teens to, to, to see some, to, like to go to, to, to rock concerts, to go to metal concerts that would play in Sao Paulo only. And in one of these uh, uh, metal festivals that I came to, I remember I was with my first girlfriend. I said, I'm going to, during our trip, I'm going to go after Coffin Joe. And through some friends at college that, that were, they were writing an essay on Coffin Joe, that they interviewed him. I found out the address of his studio here in Sao Paulo. And there I went. And then I presented myself, I'm your fan. I live in South Brazil. I need to see your films desperately. How do I find them? You know, I remember he, he wasn't, he wasn't very helpful, but at least I was able to get to walk out of there with a, another VHS from from something video that that was, it was hellish flesh. Yes. Like, yeah. So I walked out of there with a, a VHS of a hellish flesh, and I was. Wait, happy. did you say that the, that was a something weird video cassette that he gave you in Brazil? No, he 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 sold it to me. He sold it. <laughs> And by and that, that's <laughs> remarkable, just because it it really speaks to how how difficult the films were to find in their country of production. Because when Mike Franey and something weird brought those VHS cassettes to North America, the, that was the first time that Mojica's films, to my knowledge, were written about in English. Uh, Tim Lucas, I forget the publisher, but Cult Cult Movies Magazine did a cover story on him, and we were all so excited. Uh, but those VHS cassettes, you know, they were kind of they were quickly subtitled. I think Andrei Barsinski did the translations. Uh, he was yeah, a great ambassador for Mojica's films in North America. Yeah, Andrei Barsinski was the one man responsible for bringing Coffin Joe to America. By the way, yeah. Andre is here. I believe he's here listening to us. I oh, Andre, if you're here, I, I have not spoken to Andre since I want to say 2000 or 2001, uh, the year that we first brought Mojica to Montreal, the Imperial Cinema. We showed 35 millimeter prints of Awakening of the Beast, uh, Admit It'll Take Your Soul. We might have also done, I think we did this Nettle Possessor Corpse. I think we did the first three. Uh, but if you're here, Andre. It's it's an obligatory title, like, you know, like yeah. see Hell in Technicolor, you have to show that. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. But you know, like said, in Brazil, you're getting the American VHSs way, way <laughs> after the fact. It's so strange that that would be the best, the optimal way to see them in their country of production. I would have thought that there'd be 
so because my impression of him always was that he was sort of a weird underground institution there. I mean, he took over a church and made it a production studio. You know, he had he had like almost uh, an army of followers who'd be extras in his movies and would do just about anything with like spiders and snakes, whatever he and Italy asked him to do for the camera. So I just imagine that those things must have been fairly the films must have been fairly easy to come across. No, funny, even with the TV funny. series. And funnily enough, you know, when these films came out in theaters in the 60s, 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them were like, you know, gigantic box office. Uh, uh, That's everything I've ever been told. Exactly that, that they were institutions. Zeno Kai Show was Brazil's boogeyman and everybody seemed to know who he was. He seemed to be a very mainstream figure in a weird way, as transgressive and, and anti-establishment as those movies were. Yeah, that, that was because of television. <laughs> yeah, people never really got to see his movies uh, like like in the majority of Brazil. So like like one or two titles came up in, on VHS, and we read in the press that, that they had a whole catalog that Mike Rennie, Mike Rennie from something weird put up a whole catalog of his film films, which was unthinkable. So mm. we had to import. It's such good work, Mujica. And Ivan Cardoso afterwards. Mike Rennie was really just. Yeah, great man for doing what he did. Well, he's an institution, right? You know, yeah. like he's a legend, right? Uh, yeah, but like, and, and I remember I found this. I found this. This is a yeah. this is a republishing of uh, the, the the comics by Mujica in the '60s, mm -hmm. and um, I bought this in 1989. Because I was still so curious about uh, Mojica. My Mojica, by the way, got to sign this for me like uh, many years later. Mojica had the most complicated autograph anyone could read because it was totally like curly, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> but that was when I met him. But the funny thing is that after this one coming to, to Sao Paulo, that I, I came to see Marilyn Manson or Ozzy Osbourne playing in Sao Paulo, and I found him in his studio. Um, we had a very long conversation that day. He was coming back from a shoot of one of these many unfinished films. Right. Um, and after talking to him, I said, like, I really, I think I, think I want to make movies, you know, because it's not a big deal. You know, he, this guy came, just came back from the street, like with six or seven people helping him, helping him out. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can do that. It's not that big circus that we see like, like on television or on yeah. like behind the scenes uh, uh, specials that were so popular back in the day. person crews, yeah. Yeah, so then I, I, I was in journalism school and uh, I, I started working as PA. I, I said, okay, I'm, go I'm going to pursue a career in filmmaking. I started working as a PA in a lot of production companies. And uh, I remember one night, about 11 o'clock, my phone rang and I picked it up. I was living with my parents uh, 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 in Porto Alegre, the city where Fantaspoa happens, yeah. my, home, my hometown. And uh, I picked up the phone and it was Mojica. And he said, look, I, 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 I'm at the airport here in Porto Alegre. Uh, and I came, here, I, I came to your state because I'm going to shoot a film here. Uh, it's a Western, I'm going to play The Undertaker uh and uh, nobody came to pick me up and it's 11 30 at night and uh like i don't know where to go i don't know what to do could you come over here and help me out mm -hmm. so uh, i got my dad's car i went to the airport and uh at the airport we were we were uh, uh calling people from from phone booths and trying to figure out where the people from the production were at they were nowhere to be found. And uh, the production manager of this Western was Satan, which means in Portuguese, Satan, which is that, that, that the Brazilian wrestler that was in so many of his films. Oh. And, uh, yeah, so uh, in Embodiment of Evil as well. And uh, Satan didn't did show up to pick him up. So at some point it was like 1 a.m. He mm -hmm. said, look, Mojica said, look, there is a sound system here at the airport. We could ask the lady who announces the flights if she could, you know, call Satan. Because if he's at the airport, he's going to find me. 
Yeah, you can't you can't miss Mojica from like a block away. <laughs> I was like, okay, let's let's go over there. So we, we, we found a place where the announcements were made. The, the girl at the microphone said, "Look, you know, uh, uh, the, the, this gentleman he needs to find another gentleman. Um, could you call him to see if he's at the airport?" And she said, "Okay, yeah. Well, what is his name?" And I said, "Mojica, what is Satan's name?" Mojica said, "It's Satan." <laughs> Paging oh, Satan. No, <laughs> is that what they did? What is his real name? I don't know what his real name is. <laughs> Tell her to, you know, call for Satan. Yeah. And did she did it. it. She was a like, Mr. Satan. Mr. Satan. And everybody at the airport was looking at us like. <laughs> <laughs> and he did show up. He was at the airport. It was a big airport. He was, you know, having a beer with the, the other guys that. that okay. Day. Yeah, they came to pick him up, you know, the other guys from the production who came to pick him up. So, yeah, Satan showed up. It's <laughs> a good story. <laughs> so, so after, after that, a, a real friendship started. And then I got to make my first short film, uh, Nocturno, that was back in Nocturno. It was a vampire film that I made back in 1998. And I when still we got the VHS for it. Yeah, it's a 16 millimeter film. So we were all fascinated, you know, editing the movie, like in the movie, Ola and, Ara and, uh, and the, the, the flat pad. So mm -hmm. when the, 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 the first cut was ready, I brought Mojica over to, to Porto Alegre to watch it and tell me what he thought. And he gave us a lot of insights on the film that we changed it. We changed it completely. Uh, you know, he came up with a different ending if we re realigned some shots together and it did work. So I dedicated the movie to him. Uh, and uh, after, after that, I left my hometown to, to come live in Sao Paulo because, the, because there was a lot of more work for me here than back there. And then we started to be close friends. I started like going to his house, I met his family. And, um, and he always told me that he wanted to make this. This is the 1969 original script of Embodiment of Evil. He said, this is the, this is the, the ending of the Coffin Joe trilogy. It's a film that I was never able to make. Uh, the dictatorship, the Brazilian dictatorship didn't make things any easier, especially after uh, the Awakening of the Beast. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a dream. It's a dream that I have. Question though, why, did, why is it that he made Awakening of the Beast before doing the third film? Since you would think naturally he'd want to make the third one right after this night. I, th I think it, it's, it was for commercial reasons. Okay. Because he, uh, uh, after, after the, 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 the first uh, two installments of the trilogy, At Midnight, I Take Your Show, and This Night of Possessor Corpse, his popularity went sky high. He became a television personality. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and he, had, he was the breadwinner you know, for, his, for, for his family. Mojica has a very extensive family. So uh, um, I think he, like, other projects came in the way. The third film, which was played at Fantasia this year, and which is my favorite Coffin Joe film, which is A Strange World of Coffin, Coffin Joe, came up. And it was pretty much based on these. Mm -hmm. These are Love my friends. I, I spent a, a huge deal of money, you know, getting the original uh, Coffin Joe comics from the 60s. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and the, 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 the blueprint for, for the Stranger World of Coffee and Joe is in some of these stories. So I think there was a big demand because this popular, this comics got so popular to make, you know, the, the, the film. And after that, other pro projects came in the way. But um, funny, funny enough, you know, when he wanted to, when he had a slot to make a, a Embodiment of Evil happening, you know, he was on a low down you know, in his popularity and he wasn't able to secure funds and he started making other films for other producers, okay. uh, non-horror films. Like he, he had a, he had a stinted porn, you know, he, he made three. Yeah, I've heard about that. He, had a, a, he made three porn films. So um, that was, you know, like an unfulfilled dream. Yeah. And by, and, yeah, and by then, I, I made a connection of it, which was very important. I connected uh, a Mojica to Paulo Sacramento. Yes. Was, uh, the the and your own stuff. 
And he was he was the one that he was the one guy who made everything happen. You know, mm -hmm. he said, "I want to make." He Paulo is a very he's a very uh, uh, famous and respected film editor here in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And he said, "I only produce the films that I want to edit, and I want to edit a Mojica film." That's so, beautiful. you know, and who wouldn't want to edit a Mojica film? The editing, especially in the early films, the editing is so impressive. In terms of editing and composition, aesthetically, those those early films are absolute inspirations. And I feel like a lot of people who don't really know Mojica's work that well see the, the carnivalesque imagery in photographs and imagine that the films are going to be kind of slapdash quick films. And they don't get like how specific every image in these films are, how obsessively put together they are. Everything is a choice. Nothing is just kind of random, eh, whatever, we got it, let's move on. For a guy making films under such difficult circumstances, it's incredible how much artistry there is and sophistication and everything. Right down to the scratch animation for optical effects when there was no money to do them otherwise. It's so resourceful and brilliantly executed. Uh, but yeah, I can totally see any editor like looking at his work going, I want to work with somebody like this because very few people were approached Montage the way he did. Well, then you know, it's, it's very well deserved. You know, your comment is very uh, precise and very well deserved. Because Mujica is the only guy I know that started making films in celluloid when he was fucking 12 years old. <laughs> and he never stopped. Yeah. I don't know if you ever heard this, 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 this anecdote here, but uh, there was a warehouse cleaning at the Brazilian Cinematheque about uh, 20 years ago, 18, 20 years ago. Uh, Mojica was known at the Cinematheque because his films were uh, stored in there, his negatives yep. were stored in there. And he got this phone call from one of the technician, the, the preservation technicians from the Cinematheque. And he said, look, Mojica, I found this little reel of a 16 millimeter film. It's very degraded. Uh, I took a look, at, a look at it because I didn't know what it was. And there is a kid in there. I think that kid is you. It's a kid, it's like a 13 year old kid wearing a fake beard. And <laughs> Even then. <laughs> it's an Arabian stories kind of uh, short film. Mm -hmm. You know, people were wearing like, you know, Oriental costumes and everything. Could you come in and take a look? And it was really him. And he was 13 years old. So uh, uh, he has a, a whole life. We imagine the funeral, his that archivist actually spotted it and brought it to his attention. That's so cool. Imagine the level of his experience. Yeah, he was making this night of possess your corpse. You know, he was he was an outstanding talent. You know, he knew he knew a lot of all about, about optics. You know, like when he shot there, there he has a, 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 the, the 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 story called the adventurer's fate. It was one feature film that he directed before the Coffee Jewel films. And there is this legend here in Brazil that, you know, like this is the first Brazilian Cinemascope film. Okay, but how the hell did, did this guy made a Cinemascope film? I yeah. heard that he got a Cinemascope uh, lens from a projector and adapted it into a camera. It and he, camera. Made, he is Cinemascope. Like, so what the fuck, you know, this guy was like a, a, a technical visionary by the time, you know. Mm. Um, and I like that he would talk about the hardships of the technical side of making films very casually in his horror narratives, as if the general population would understand. Like in, in Awakening of the Beast, there's that whole bit when he starts screaming about the difficulties of, of getting raw stock. Virgin stock to shoot on. I was, I, I was, yeah, so enamored by that type of thing. But the thing, he, he lived and breathed and thought cinema so much that he would talk about like the basic constructions in ways where he would just presume anyone else in the room would instantly get it and know what he's talking about because it was just the, the way he operated all the time. Yeah, from, you know, from my experience with I, I so yeah, to say that. And then there, there's this beautiful story that his dad was a, was a, a theater manager, a movie theater manager. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was the one super spoiled kid in the poor neighborhood who would you know bring all the, the kids from school to watch movies for free at his right. dad cinema so uh, uh he expanded like his cinematic culture in a very naive kind of way uh Marcinski tells a very story a famous story about that time uh he was talking about orson welles movies with mojica 
And Wojika said, I think I saw a movie with this one fat guy. It was a story that happened in the border of Mexico. Like he's talking about people, but he yeah, didn't he know he didn't part know part Wells's part. name. Was that he wasn't aware of Wells's name? He just knew the film visually. He, he knew about it, but he was not really into it. But like when yeah. he was he had at his that cinema, he saw Touch of Evil, and he remember the movie that 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 guy was in. You know, like. Mm -hmm. So it, it, he had this naive way of uh, looking and collecting all these references. Uh, but he was really into exploitation stuff. Like, he, sure. I remember he told, always tell, tell that he was fascinated about some sexual education films that his dad played at the theater. And he would, <laughs> would, like, would see a, a vagina with gonorrhea. And he was right. 13 years old and he was shocked to see that. And he would bring the kids from school to see that. that his dad. <laughs> Theater, you know, like. oh, classroom scare, uh, classroom scare films traumatized generations in North America as well. That was a thing for a long time. And I mean, and you drive, would think that the teachers didn't realize it wasn't drivers working. ad movies. What in America? Drivers ads. Uh, drivers oh ad God, movies. yeah. What was it mechanized death? <laughs> That's the classic one. Yeah, those are horrific. Those are borderline snuff films, and it's it should not be legal to show that type of thing to kids. I mean, that's. Those films are genuinely horrific. The VD ones are just very strange for, for to be showing in a school environment. And they made impressions, but they also felt like science fiction, I think, to most people, you know, <laughs> in that period. Uh, but yeah, it's great that Mojica as well had experiences being traumatized by classroom scare films or the Brazilian equivalent of fantastic. Let me, let me show you a picture, a picture of that time, which is, yeah. uh, which is really cool uh, here. I have this one picture here, which is <laughs> that's great. Okay, this is this is the, the the guy with the tank girl shirt. This is me when I wasn't a filmmaker yet. I was uh -huh. just a young boy coming to visit Mojica, and these people around here, it's it's white zombie. Yes, it's white zombie. This this that's guy, <laughs> the guy kneeling down there is Rob Zombie. Yep. Yeah. That's that's amazing. That was you know, been, what would that be? Would that be like like 90 or 89 or something 1994. like that? 94, okay. Yeah. So okay, man, where do I take this conversation to now? Oh uh, I mean there, there's so many ways we can go. I, I would say the first time you start to collaborate with Mojica, maybe as a writer. Yes, yes. Uh, by the way, there, there's uh, there's something people don't know that I wrote two scripts for Magica. I, I wrote, uh, you know, the, the new version of the old uh, Embodiment of Evil script, mm -hmm. you know, which became Embodiment of Evil. Um, but I, uh, after Embodiment of Evil, Paulo Sacramento really wanted to line up a second project for Magica to have. It made uh, that made sense. That film opened in Venice. It went to all these huge festivals. Yeah, and I wrote this script called Eye Gouger. You told me, about, okay, I remember the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that one that never came to be, you know. Why, it, why did it not come? To, was it Mojica's health or was it, what was it? I think it was mostly because of Mojica's health because uh, right after, like, uh, like less than a year after I completed the script, I moved to the States. Uh, I lived in New the York. States for four years. Uh, I was going to film school there. And uh, Mojica's uh, health started going downhill. So this project was never talked about anymore. Uh, but it, it's a pretty cool story. You know, it, 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 it's about, you know, these uh, spiritualist healers that, you know, like make like uh, spiritual operations using like kitchen knives on people. It's a very common like event. Like in many countries yeah. in the world, there are these healers like, uh, like come up with they perform surgeries with very rudimentary uh, instruments being possessed by the, the, the spirit of a doctor <laughs> so Mojica played one of those he was a, a, a blind man a blind miracle man mm -hmm. and, uh, but he had a secret life that at night he would kidnap people and uh, and he would gouge their eyes out using a corkscrew and he would eat their eyes and he would see things his victims saw. Right. So by seeing what he saw in his mind after eating the eyes, 
he learned a, a lot of secrets about the little town. You know, he right. brought his, you know, miracle healing camp too. Yeah. So he, he would know exactly like, what to say to people about their departed loved ones and everything else that he needed to, I presume. Yeah. And he started like, you know, puppeteering, like, you know, the mayor, the police chief, because he knew that these people had very very Oh, I could see, I could so see Mojica loving that. And it becomes almost like another Phoenix Ominous movie too, in a weird way. It could be one way. of those, you know, oh, that's such a shame. Did he like the script? I presume he must have. Yeah, yeah, I had, I had, a, I had a ball writing it. It was really fun. No, but did Mojica like it? I presume he did. Yeah, he did. You know, he was totally into it. And uh, uh, he really approved of the, I think it wrote three drafts of it, that he was very happy with the third one. Okay. Uh, oh, one thing we should touch on. Uh, I remember back when you, when Embodiment Evil was being made and we were messaging when you were shooting, uh, you'd mentioned something along the lines of, Mojica briefly wanted to do wire work for a fight scene and you had to talk him out of doing a stunt like that? He wanted to do what? Like wire work? He wanted to do a fight scene that he would, when he wouldn't have a double. He wanted to actually do a fight scene and I remember you telling me that he wanted to do like wire work, like what was popular in you know the Matrix at the time, or Crouching Tiger, or films like that. You know, I, when wires pull people through the air uh, to accentuate a blow in martial arts or something like this. Yeah, 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 no, very know, dangerous right. for a senior citizen to try to do. Needless to say, <laughs> wire food, right? It's wire food. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Wire well, food, exactly. Well, no, well, you can never. I don't recall anything like using wire foo for anything? Well, it never happened. No, but I, I okay, because I remember you telling me a story that he wanted to do a stunt and he wanted to do the, the, the latest technique of this wire work. And you were talking about him doing that entirely, that he wanted to do like, his own stunts where he would be pulled somewhere. Oh, and, unless I'm just somehow hallucinating, because uh, this is going back to, I guess this would have been, film came out 2008, this would have been 2006, 2007 that we would have been messaging. I don't well, know. I'm familiar with that story, but like, where well, if there's okay. one hanging people yeah well she could did hang people in, in, in embodiment of evil but it was like body mod performers who like right. were like, and pulling, being pulled by hooks like for real yeah uh, remember that yeah the for real character the, the, the for real you know element in embodiment of evil like was very exacerbated <laughs> <laughs> like I mean, that, that's been pronounced in his entire filmography as much as he was ever able to do it uh, to have yeah. people do real physical things uh, that were counterintuitive, shall we say. <laughs> you, know? you tell me about counterintuitive. But, like, but it's funny, man. Like, you know, the extent uh, people were really to go to, you know, just to make shit happen with Mojica. Yeah. Be covered with spiders and insects of all kinds. And, I mean, some of the things that you'd have people do in the church environment is just mind-blowing. There was uh, the great Barsinski did a, not Barsinski, sorry, um, Cardoso did a great documentary, a short film documentary on Mojica. Yes. When was it, late 70s maybe? Or? It was late 70s, yes. Yeah, like I saw it in the compilation. I feel like it was around the time of Hellish Flesh probably or something like that. But when he had the production studio in a church, and I don't know if it was being cheated for the camera to like make it bigger, but it really seemed like he had like at least a hundred people or something with him that were ready to just do anything like, fall on the streets in a crowded environment and just scream as if they were possessed uh, until everyone runs away, like in, in crowded market square areas and things like that. Yeah, I think you're talking about two different things. You know, there was a time where we had the studio at the synagogue. Mm -hmm. but what it was the synagogue. Was Interesting. I'm Jewish. Oh, exactly. I'm Jewish. But uh, uh, during many years when Mojica was not, you know, what was in a low in his popularity that, you know, he, uh, he was able to make ends meet by uh, he had a, a, a theater school. Mm. Uh, he, he gave acting classes. So uh, I remember, I know exactly the, 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 uh, I know exactly the, 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 the film you're talking about. He was, uh, was a documented class, someone shot a class uh, in his uh, acting school in which he was telling the students that they were on a plane that was about to, f to fall from the sky. Okay. And he got people into a, into a trance and they were crazy and in panic. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's a very rare uh, uh, documented class of Mojica's acting class. And it was crazy, man. I, I think that was, that, yeah, that, I think that was in, in Ivan Cardoso's uh, documentary, The Universe of Mojica Marines. It was either yeah. on that documentary or on another documentary called Will of the Wisp. 
Yeah. Oh, I haven't seen that. Yeah. I've only seen two. I've seen Andre's one from like 2000, the one that was at Sundance. And, yeah, but, uh, but, yeah, but, this, but yeah. this one, this one a segment that I'm talking about, about the, the, the falling plane yeah. uh, exercise, it was on Moji, uh, on Barsiski documentary. Okay, so that, yeah, that must have been where I saw the footage. Amazing. So do you want to talk more about, um, again, just the collaborative spirit, how, you, how the two of you work together? And how that maybe evolved over the years, because you had, I mean, you made that one film, but you, you, were, you were friends for many, many years and you were constantly like bouncing ideas from what I understand. Yes, yes. Uh, um, we both love comics. Mojica and I uh, love the Savage Sword of, Con uh, the Savage Sword of Conan. Uh -huh. Mojica was a, was a Conan freak. So- You never uh, met him, was, that's interesting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think I loved uh, Conan, and, and I remember that you know he never heard about Frank Frazetta, and I gave him uh, on Christmas a Frank Frazetta uh, book, right. and he, he flipped. flipped. You know? Yeah, because That's he was incredible. He, he wasn't aware. I would have thought that would be exactly his thing. You know, it just was totally up his avenue. And uh, by the way, his house was a museum of uh, you know all tack cool things tacky. Like, yeah. <laughs> like every kind of like weird, like cheap curiosity was, you know, lining up the walls. And, uh, and by the way, now after he, after, after, you know, he made the passage, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know where all that cool stuff went, but he had a very a huge I collection. Cornell, I mean, Cornell, I, I would imagine took care of it and made sure the stuff wasn't just thrown out. Oh, I don't know. Probably, I think he, 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 the, the family got it stashed somewhere. Yeah. But uh, uh, so Conan was a huge link between myself and Mujica. I could yeah. talk a lot about Conan. And, uh, uh, um, and then Embodiment of Evil came. And uh, it took us seven years to convince the Brazilian government, which was the, the main funding uh, uh, mechanism of Brazilian cinema mm -hmm. to believe in Mojica that he was able and capable and popular enough uh, and that embodiment of, of evil needed to be done mm -hmm. uh, even if for a matter of historical reparation yeah you know? right so we, we were we were able to secure the funds other producers came on board even uh, uh, 20th century Fox came up in the end remember that announcement to distribute, yeah. to distribute the film. Off Brazil. And uh, um, yeah, so after this seven years, you know, pre-production started and both pre-production and principal photography uh, were very challenging. First of all, uh, pre-production because we, got, we had to find all alternative, alternative underground intelligence you know, around Sao Paulo to be Mojica's film and do whatever he wanted, you know, yeah. because you know, like real actors, like very few of them would, would want to have anything to do with Mojica. So we had to go after secret circus people, freak show people, body modification artists, tattoo artists, uh, uh, all kind of crazy people that, you know, would like do whatever crazy shit was you, was you could, whatever one of them to pull it, it out. It loops back very organically to his earliest work then. I mean, in that way, that's that's really sweet. It's hard to believe though that like at that time, the current actors wouldn't have wanted anything to do with someone like him because you would just think that with all that history and uh, you know, the films are a testament to his abilities with no resources at all, what he was able to do. Yeah, no, absolutely. But still, you know, there was one thing that was really, damaging to not to Mojica himself but the kind of uh, uh, filmmaking Mojica uh, devoted himself to which was you know low budget uh, independent horror filmmaking mm -hmm. uh, there was you know this trash movie fad of the 90s you know with the rediscovery yeah. of Ed Wood and everything people were labeling everything like trash cinema and then and Mojica's cinema uh, suffered a lot, you know, having received that tag by, by people who understood jack shit about what he made. Presumably people who've never seen the work, if they could say that. that that's, but yeah, I remember, even, even here, I mean, people didn't know and think he was just like kind of like a schlocky B-movie guy. And you show him any five minutes of the first three films and you know, you'd make instant believers, even if they're not genre people. Between his, his philosophical monologues, 
that were just insane in terms of their, you know, their, their length, their delivery, the poetry of it, the aspirations, philosophically, where he's trying to go with them, and then the sheer aesthetics of the storytelling. I mean, nobody made movies like him. You, you know, know like, it's, it's unthinkable. Like, you know, his, his camera work was very sophisticated, by the way. Usually. How did he work with Giorgio Attili? By the, Attili was his operator for most of the early films, right? Who? Giorgio Attili? Giorgio Attili, yeah, man. That right. well, I never got to meet him. You know, he was he was he was deceased. You know, like when when I got to become friend, we become friends with Wojcika. Well, Wojcika talked with him with immense respect, and he misses him a lot. He was a very close collaborator. Yeah, uh, I think he was a right hand man on this. Had to have been because aesthetically, again, you know, <laughs> like and, you know, yeah. But like he was, he, he was, he was, a, he was really good with lighting, with creating atmospheric lighting, uh, especially for the black and white films. Mm -hmm. You know, he was incredibly successful in delivering that kind of results back then. Um, by the way, then after after Atili, you know, uh, Mojica collaborated in, in, in *Embodiment of Evil* with José Roberto Eliezer which was, you know, the cinematographer for a lot from Mother Only and Ninjas. And, okay. and the, 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 the segment of ABCs of that that I directed, mm -hmm. uh, who was a genius. He was one of the most sophisticated. Oh, did he pass away? No, he did he not. Oh, no, you he said he was a genius. I was like, oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Good. George, George Otili passed away. Oh, yeah, he's, know. Know. he's a very important Brazilian cinematographer mm -hmm. uh, and a very good friend. I love him very much. And everything he puts his word, uh, his hand on, you know, turns to gold because yeah. he's so experienced uh, and, and he knows a lot about painting. So he really enriched the visuals for, for Embodiment of Evil. But like, so, but after these seven years and uh, a very, uh, a pre-production that was pretty fun, mm -hmm. uh, we, 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 we had a very rough shoot for embodiment of evil, it, it was really difficult, and the main the main difficult the, the worst of them all is that we we lost uh, a, a very important actor uh, midway through shooting. Spiritualist character, right? Yeah, uh, which, uh, uh, he, uh, it, his name was Jesse Valadão. Jesse Valadão is like a sacred monster of Brazilian cinema, and uh, and he was Coffin Joe's nemesis in the film. Yeah. He was the lawman who was after Coffin Joe's ass. Uh, and he oh, I was thinking of a different actor. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he shot about half of his scenes. Uh, he, was, he, uh, he was an elderly uh, gentleman and uh, he fell ill and went to a film festival where he would receive a, like a lifetime of lifetime oh, cheap oh. rewards. And he came back from that festival with a pneumonia and like uh, uh, 10 days later, he died. So we kind of, we, we had to rewrite the script of Embodiment of Evil on set and figure out a way to continue the story of that character without him because we didn't have the money to shoot all the scenes with a different actor, the, the, the scenes that were already uh, uh, shot. So that was a, a, a huge blow and then it was a huge challenge. Yeah. Um, Oh, that would that that would be hard in any type of production, regardless of budget. Yeah, I remember when when Coffin Ray Raymond Castile, who played young Coffin Joe in mm. *Embodiment of Evil*, when he arrived on set in Brazil, coming from the states, there was all this expectation. Wow, Coffin Ray is coming tomorrow, and <laughs> the dude arrived on set on the very day that uh, Jesse Valadon died. Oh. So, people barely realized that he was there. And when I saw him, I, I introduced myself, hey Ray, I'm Dennis, I'm the one who's been talking to you over email and we gave you, uh, brought you the invitation to be here. Man, I'm so sorry your welcome is not being as warm as it should be, but we just lost a, a colleague here. We just lost an actor. Like he was appalled, like, you know, my God, what happened, you know? Yeah. Uh now, I, I think you had some footage that you wanted to show as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have some stuff, like very uh, emotional stuff. So let's get to it. Uh, first of all, I have some pictures that about my personal history with Mojica. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see. Okay. 
So this is one, this is a rare one. This poster. is the poster that we wanted the poster of Embodiment of Evil to be like. Mm -hmm. Even Mujica liked this, this, this one better than the official one because it was so mysterious that the, the distributors, distributors didn't like that, didn't like the fact that we couldn't see Mujica's face. I can kind of understand it. It's the first time he's back in that character after so much time that I, I could see them wanting to capitalize on that and make it very unambiguous what this movie was going to be. But yeah, that is cool art. So this is when the, the, the movie came out. We was just like, you know, uh, 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 we were approving all the, the, the advertising pieces that were going to be in, the, in cinemas. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the, the final poster that yeah. a lot of people know. This is me and Coffin Ray on set. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Coffin Ray was a cannibal Holocaust shirt. <laughs> By the way, I hope Coffin Ray is here and listening to us. Uh, I told him that uh, we would have this talk here and I urge him to, to be here with us. Great. Uh, it, it'll actually be preserved on our YouTube so people will be able to see it afterwards as well. Yeah, yeah. man. Like, and I, I hope a lot of people get to see, on, see it on YouTube too. But uh, I think it's impossible to talk about uh, embodiment of evil, not talk about Coffin Ray. Mm -hmm. Raymond Castillo is, is not an actor. You know, he's a big uh, uh, a fan of horror films and collector of a horror memorabilia from Missouri. And uh, on one Halloween, he dressed up like Coffin Joe. And the resemblance, his physical resemblance to Coffin Joe when he was young uh, 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 was so starking that we had to find him and bring him over to Brazil. <laughs> but we didn't have, to have the money to do that yeah. because our budget was so tight. So I tracked, him, I tracked him down and I wrote him an email and said, look, man, you don't know me. We're making Mojica's new film. And uh, he really, really wants you to play young Coffin Joe. And uh, Raymond came all the way from the States from his own dime to be Coffin Joe. And his scene as young Coffin Joe is just brilliant mm -hmm. because it's basically a... Uh, 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 an immediate follow-up of the last scene of uh, this night of Possessor Corpse. Well, in this night of Possessor Corpse, Coffin Joe dies drowned in a swamp. And when he re when Coffin Ray uh, and anybody with the people, he resurfaces from that swamp and kills a priest. Mm -hmm. So Coffin Ray, like, man, I salute you. Great scene. <laughs> And it was so good to tell, you know, this war story of this man coming all the way from the States to be Coffin Joe in a film. So this is me on the staff. <laughs> this was a great uh, <laughs> Cool. I, know, I never saw that one. That's great. Yeah, that was a cool one because like Mojica didn't want to drown in the lake of pool, pool in, the, in, the, uh, in the pool. Oh, you were just standing? Yeah, I was a standing. I didn't know that. You never mentioned that. Oh, my God. Yeah. I'm standing on this platform. <laughs> this platform was submerged into, into, uh, into a pond of uh, uh, fake blood because yeah. we got, didn't want to submerge. <laughs> so I was just standing. I at, at the age he was by that point, I could understand it being worried about getting soggy in that type of situation. <laughs> wow, that must have been a trip. That must have, what, a, what an amazing experience that must have been. Oh, this is another uh, uh, behind the scenes uh, photo. Uh, that's when Mojica, uh, when uh, Zé do Caixão meets one, uh, one of the victims from uh, At Midnight I'll Take Your Soul, mm -hmm. uh, the girl who committed suicide by hanging herself, the, the girl who Coffin Joe raped uh, in the movie. So she's back from the dead, you know, to torment him. So the, the, the actress is all painted in yellow because Mojica wanted all the ghosts in the film. The film was a color, uh, a film in color. You wanted the ghosts to be black and white. Or close black and white. Yeah, I remember that. So good. This is another famous uh, 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 shot from the film. Uh, this is uh, the, this, uh, the, the, the one scene with the spiders from uh, one of my favorite scenes in the, in the movie. This is actress Haisa Gregori, who was like suffering a lot poor girl because she didn't adapt to the to the, you know, the the lenses on her eyes oh so it was a very difficult shoot because she was she was in a lot of pain but she really wanted to carry through the scene to the end 
That's a trooper. So now that I've seen, this is me in the foreground. Uh, was you in his directorial chair back there? Yeah. And this oh, is a very it. emotional scene. The after we just wrapped the the the, the shoot of the the, the feature it was yeah. a very emotional moment. Beautiful moment. Oh. That's me holding the skull mm -hmm. back in there. Yeah. Back in the corner over there. Over there. Yeah. Oh, even Crunel's there. Was that? Even Crunel's there. Is that Crunel? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. Cool. Cronel, Cronel is here. Uh, Paulo Sacramento, the producer, is here. Deborah Muniz, the actress from Love of Mother Only, is here too. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lo a lot of lovely people worked with that in the, with the, in the movie. Like, it, it's, it's, I get emotional just seeing that picture. Yeah, no doubt. Beautiful. Um, so, and, uh, well, wow, Embodiment of Evil was uh, when completed. It was uh, uh, it was uh, it had an amazing performance like around the world. Uh, it premiered at Fantasia. Uh, well, no, it, that was Canadian premiere. It premiered in Venice, didn't it? Venice Film Festival. Oh, it, went, it went to Venice afterwards. We premiered what? at Fantasia, man. No, 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 no. I promise not. We couldn't play it the first time because it went to Venice, and Venice was like two weeks after we ended. Really? And then we it, yeah, we were the Canadian or maybe North American premiere. But we did it the next year. And then we brought Mojica in and had him come out of the coffin and we gave him the award and did all Okay, whole... so you guys were the Canadian premiere. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I have it. It was so, that was my heartbreak of the year and th that we couldn't have it in time. And then when I learned that it was because it was going to Venice, I was like, oh, good. Mojica's going to be fucking celebrated in Venice. I was so excited. But yeah, I, I vividly remember how upset I was initially when it seemed that this wouldn't be possible to book without the reason, you know? But there's a but in any case, yeah, we, we did do at least a national premiere of it, and it was an amazing night. But there was a story that I love to tell. I always love to tell that you know, mm -hmm. Mojica, he had this big ring uh, that was given to him by uh, Boris, Boris Karloff's daughter oh. like in, in, a, in a festival back in the 70s. At least okay. that's what he tells, that he had this big ring that was given to him that belonged to Karloff, and it was given to him by Karloff's daughter. And at the premiere uh, in Montreal of Embodiment of Evil, during the screening, we were sitting at the front row. Uh, Mojica lost the ring. So I was like on all fours, looking under the seats uh, at our, our beloved auditorium at Fantasia, the, the big yeah. auditorium. The hall of I was Concordia. looking for the Karloff ring, and I found it. And I found it. I, I always love to tell this story, like how I went after a, a ring that belonged to Boris Karloff at Fantasia's Jeez. premiere of Embodiment of Evil. I don't remember. I pre you must have told me that night, but I don't remember. That's incredible. Thank God it was found. Oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wonder where this ring is now. Oh my God. Like, Again, I, I trust that Crunel took care of the stuff. I can't imagine that it was just like like the end of Citizen Kane or something, you know, where everything's just. I, I really, yeah, I, I hope no, it's all been properly. We will take good probably. care of his, of, of you know, of his, of his belongings, you know, of his, uh, 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 of his library. He had a, a library that he loved mm -hmm. so much at home, especially the comics library. Yeah. Oh. But yeah, man, uh, and well. After Embodiment of Evil, we kind of went separate ways, not meaning that we we remained close friends to the end of his life. Uh, but then I spent that time abroad, you know, I lived four years in New York. And, um, and after I came back, I, I got to see him a number of times. Uh, I saw him when he was very, very sick. He could barely walk. He could barely talk. Uh, oh. But see, he still remembered me, and it was, it was very, very touching, you know. And I remember that uh, he would walk around the house uh, because he was very anxious to stay, to stay still on the on the same place in the house. So he would ask me to walk him to his bedroom at the back of the house and bring him back to the living room, um, and. Uh, I had his, I held his hand, man. 
I held his fucking hand, I held his little hand. It's, yeah, yeah, man, it was, it was difficult, man, uh, to see him that way. I remember one time uh, during the shoot, it was a, grew, a, a, very, a very, very hectic shoot, the, the, the shooting day. And he was 72 years old when he made the body of evil. And um, he finished the day and I took his cape out. And his cape was heavy with his sweat. And I, like every time I feel lazy or every time I feel like I'm not in a bad mood to deal with shit in my own work. I remember that and I say, Denison, like, dude, put your shit back together, man. Like, Wojika was 72 years old and you held that cape that was heavy with sweat. Yeah. Like, he was such an example and he was such a gentleman. Uh, I, I miss him a lot. Coffin Ray said to me last week when I invited him to, to watch the webinar here today, he said, Mojica was obviously holding the world together. Now that his world, now that he's gone, the world has gone to shit. Yeah. And I can't agree with him more. At least, you know, as far as my world is concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. I, and there's also a terrible element where like he, he'd made the early films in defiance of the dictatorship. And the fact that he would pass in a period where there's an authoritarian government again in Brazil uh, and where people's rights are being restricted in ways that I don't think he imagined were going to happen again. Um, yeah, like we Brazilian filmmakers, like every Brazilian filmmaker today, from a guy who directs a comedy to the guy who directs the most extreme horror film, uh, is a subversive creature in the eyes of this government. Like, cinema is subversive here in Brazil. So... We couldn't have a better life example as to uh, how to fight against this context as Mojica. Mm -hmm. uh, he, yeah. he's, he's always going to be a beacon of light. He is right now for all of us. Speaking of which, I don't know how much time we have. Um, we can make more time, don't worry. I, I'm yeah. not going to rush anything. <laughs> I also have a, I'm happy to miss my own awards ceremony for this. I'm not kidding. I have a couple of videos to show of, yes. you know, Mojica's funeral when we all said goodbye to him. And let's see that, man. Um, it's going to be hard. So the, the, the funeral ceremony happened at the Sao Paulo Museum of uh, Image and Sound, which is a place that Mojica loved. A loss. And so these are the hands, man. The hands that had the coffin nails. This is as much as Mojica as you're going to see on the coffin. I'm not going to show his face, yeah. but uh, I, I you sent me photos from the funeral in February, and I lost it. Yeah, I did. So the family didn't want him to be buried as coffin Joe. They I wanted to be buried as Mojica. So we have, you know, this dummy wearing his, his outfit. Oh. Did he want to be buried as Moji as Coffin Joe and the family blocked it? Yeah. Yes. They, they didn't want like a, 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 a Bela Lugosi kind of. Uh, right. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Lugosi being buried. Oh. So, yeah, man, we got to the the we have here. There is a toast for Mujica with his families. There is Cronel, our friend. Marilise, his daughter. She almost celebrated with her. Aww. 
Yeah, man. So, uh, so you guys couldn't hear me uh, when I was talking about the mariachis. Mujica, in an interview from the 70s, people asked, you know, okay, so what would Coffee Joe, how would Mujica, his funeral to be like? Right. And he said, I would like my funeral to be a party. I would like to have mariachis playing for me. So the mariachi thing is so strange. This is the last thing I would have ever imagined he would have had an appreciation for. Yeah. It is. <laughs> that is, it's, it's very sweet. Friend, Marcelo Kolayakov, who is like a guardian of Mojica's uh, uh, lifetime work, he said, I remember this interview. You should find, I'm going to find mariachis for him. And I remember them, uh, uh, me, Paulo Sacramento, Barsinski, uh, and Marcelo. You know, we got we got the money and we had the mariachis played for him. And it was a very emotional moment uh, of our goodbyes there. So beautiful. I can imagine one of the mariachi people looking in and being like, Zero Kaisho. <laughs> like, <laughs> he he felt so honored to play to him, to play for him, you know, like it's we, they felt very emotional as well. That's beautiful. I never saw that footage before. The photos you sent me, it was yeah, it would have been late February. Um, and the photos, I mean, it was during the Berlin Film Festival and I got them on, like, on WhatsApp. You sent it to me on WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, I had, to, I had to like leave the group I was with when I first, because I just got so emotional. It was the last thing I was expecting to see. I obviously had heard the news already, you know, from a few days before, but I'd never imagined to see imagery like that in the middle of, you know, just a film fest, a film market. It was the market side of the Berlin Alley. So I had the Martin Gropius bow and then here's this, but yeah, that, that's a beautiful reception. It was, it was interesting to see Cornell so happy. I mean, I'm sure he wasn't happy at all, but in terms of smiling and being in such a, um, a jovial state. Uh, yeah, there's, really, there's, really there's, nice there's, there's this one comic illustration uh, that was, uh, was published on the internet when Wojcika died. Yeah. Uh, so this hand sign here in Brazil, yeah. me, you got fucked. Oh, okay. Okay. So there's this one illustration that I found it was so tender and beautiful. And it showed the, the pearly gates of heaven open and two angels dragging Coffin Joe by force into, into heaven. heaven. And right outside the gates of heaven, there, it, there was the devil peeping through a hole in the ground, laughing and doing this to Mojica like, Coffin Joe, we really wanted to come to hell, but you will yeah. have to go to heaven, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Too good for to hell. Heaven. Has to go to heaven. Right on. That's so beautiful. Can you send that to me afterwards? It's, yeah, I, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. find it and send it to you. I certainly have it on my phone somewhere. <laughs> now uh, I see in the Q and A though, there's people who wanted to ask some questions, so we can open it up to some questions from the audience. Oh, yeah. Donato Tataro. Donato actually interviewed Mojica the first time that we brought him to Fantasia in either 2000 or 2001 uh, for Off Screen Magazine, a big article at the time. It was really great. Uh, hi, Dennis. I'm curious, how was the death of Marin's covered in Brazil? Was there a national funeral? Okay, well, that, he'd asked the question before we showed the footage. Public events, emotional outpouring from the grave diggers and garbage workers? Well, I don't know if I get the question right. Uh, I was curious I, how the death was covered in Brazil. Was there a net national tour? No, not really. Uh, it was, it, it, yeah, it was a public event. Uh, it was announced in the press, uh, but emotional outpouring from the, from the grave diggers and garbage workers. Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, but I can tell you that a lot of, you know, very strange people was in his funeral, which was to be expected, you know? Yeah. A lot of exotic people were there that I've never seen. And the fans came over. Yeah, by the way, I, I got to hide a little comic book of Conan and Red Sonia in his coffin. Oh! And, uh, like, I, I really had to give it to him, like, you know, because I know he loved Conan so much. So I, I, I hid it, you know, among the flowers in there, you know. So. Huh. Uh, so Victor Martins de Concierto, I'm so sorry I mispronounced the name, sir. Uh, Dennison asked a question from Brazilian, please. This is Victor, can you talk a bit about the Cinematica situation and how this affects the films of Mojica? So yeah, 
and we were talking about this before before we went public uh, live on, on the show. Well, I think that the greatest concern is about uh, the physical uh, camera negatives the of elements. Fujica that are uh, stored in the Brazilian Cinematheque, which was arbitrarily shut down uh, by the, gov the, the, the Bolsonaro government. Uh, unexplainably, uh, it's, it's, this is a crime against Brazilian history, a crime mm -hmm. against Brazilian art and, and, and Brazilian cinema. Uh, like judicial matters are being, you know, taken by the, the whole cinematic uh, uh, sector here in Brazil to, to question this and to try and reopen uh, the Brazilian Cinematheque. But we believe it's, uh, it's a, a vengeful political uh, uh, backlash that the artistic, uh, the artistic class and the Brazilian cinema sector here in Brazil is suffering because we did not support Bolsonaro's fascistic uh, uh, candidacy back in uh, two years ago in 2018. So I think he's getting back at us. Like uh, Bolsonaro is an open enemy of Brazilian cinema and he never, he, he never, you know, uh, uh, really wanted to hide that. In certain public statements, he said that. Mm -hmm. you know, that he thinks Brazilian cinema is, uh, subver is like too left-wing oriented, uh, too sexualized, immoral. So yeah, he, he basically hijacked the Brazilian cinema tech from the Brazilian people. So yeah, our main worries is about, is about, are about you know, Mojica's uh, uh, negatives being stored there. But I know that uh, his, he, most of his films have very great uh, 4K uh, 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 digital versions of it. So is, is that true? Because for the first, for the, you know, we wanted to do a whole series here. Uh, we, we booked three films. And the best that was available were 1080i interlaced masters, uh, not even progressive. And they looked almost like up conversions. I mean, if you see what we had, the sound is very muffled on some of them. In some cases there's audio missing entirely. Uh, and those are the most recent transfers to my knowledge. So I worry, I mean, you'd mentioned for the Cinematheque that Bolsonaro cut off the refrigeration now, which yes. scares the hell out of me because it doesn't take long in bad in bad climates for older emulsion to, you know, to well, what's the term to emulsify to turn into to go to vinegar syndrome. Yes. Begin to rot. Um, but have there been 4K scans of the earlier films and they're just not available? Because if that's the case, that would be beautiful. Okay, I might, you know, I, I might I might you know be coming up with some bullshit about that, but I, I read rumors about that. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's I know several about, labels. Want to do. Sorry? That at least he, his main films, you know, like Finis Dominus, At Midnight or Take Your Soul, This Night of Possessed Your Corpse, mm -hmm. uh, had new DCPs and, uh, and 4K versions. I don't know if they were you know, withdrawn from the, the Cinematheque in time. I hope so. But do take a, when, when we get off, check out, like uh, I gave you an accreditation, you can watch the stuff in our VOD. Uh, take a look at, at the, the master we have for Finis Dominus. And that's apparently the most recent one. Or, or a strange world, and you'll see, like, it's not great. It's better than the old VHSs, night and day better, but it's still, it's definitely not from a 4K scan, any of them, because they're not even 1080p. Yeah, I recently but, saw uh, an HD version of- uh, uh, um, At Midnight? Of Exorcismo Negro. Oh, wow, okay, that's encouraging, because that's one of the lesser ones in terms of- Man, it was like, you know, rewatching a, a whole new film, you know, like- okay. I saw things that. I saw things that that one I saw at Canal Brasil, which is the the, the Brazilian network dedicated to Brazilian cinema here in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really encouraging. The the maybe just what we were provided wasn't the most recent scans. Um, oh, that's strange. I mean, we booked them with Crunel, but in any case, uh, Andre Barsinski. Well, oh, and there's Bettina. Who, okay, so all kinds of friends are jumping in now. This is great. So we'll do Andre first. Hello, Mitch. Andre, Andre Bersinski here. Congratulations for doing this. Really great to see Mojica being honored. I will never forget the beautiful reception Fantasia and the Canadian fans gave Mojica. Really touching. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Andre, for making it happen because you were the person uh, who we, we coordinated everything with to get Mojica to Montreal the first time he visited us. 
Uh, and I'm sure you remember, we vi we met you at the airport. It was one of the few people, I, I don't usually meet the guests at the airport. Uh, I usually meet them at the hotel, in the lobby, and I went right to the airport to greet you guys. And the idea we were all imagining was you could coming through customs and what that experience was going to be like, you know? Um, but yeah, thank you so much for everything that you did. Uh, Mojiko was one of the first people that I was genuinely fully starstruck by when I met him. Uh, I was like an abs, I became a kid again. I was so excited to meet him in person. Uh, and you were just wonderful. And all the translation work you did as well was invaluable, everything. So thank you. And thank you for your work with Mike Rainey for getting the films to North America in the first place. Because yeah, anyways, I could, I'll, I'll send you an email later. We haven't, we haven't talked in forever and we should talk again. I'm really glad to hear from you. Um, and then Bettina Goldman, can, can you a life for Coffin Joe be envisaged as a character beyond his creator? RIP Mojica forever, higher than God, lower than the devil. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, that's a controversial yeah. question. Like, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I've had some talks with Bettina about that. But well, Bettina is Mojica's worldwide sales agent. He's someone who's been involved with, with his lifetime work for many years now. Yeah. And uh, she always has this question, like, you know, should Coffin Joe uh, receive a new incarnation with another actor? Uh, I'm not a big fan of the idea. <laughs> I, it's hard to imagine, but you know, it's funny, 10 years ago, I remember actually Bettina and I were discussing the possibility of a Coffin Joe you know, a, a, a younger actor playing Cop and Joe in a new series of films that were ever to happen. At the time, I was thinking Javier Bardem would have been the ultimate. He, never, he probably wouldn't have wanted to do it. But at that time, I think that he could have been such an intense and scary Cop and Joe, you know, I mean, if somebody was going to do it. Um, yes. But yeah, thinking of what he did with Perdita Durango, uh, when he would really tap into the darker energies that he has. And I think he could have really made that character work, but very few people can. And so much of it is about not, not only Mujica's performance, but the fact that these were his words. This is the way that he thought, the philosophies, the poetry, the anger. I, it's so hard to imagine just somebody else coming in and doing it as an actor, as opposed to Mujica being there as everything, the full creator. But, yeah. but who knows? I mean, I would be, I, I usually hate the idea of these kinds of things because really it is entirely, Zedekai show is Ohemi Kamat in. There's no, you know, anything else will just be kind of a riff on that and it'd be nice to see continuity of the character, but I don't know, but you were saying, so you've always been against the idea, period? Yeah, and more, more, well, my, my, the reason I, why I am against it is because I think Mojica holds a very unique place in the history of cinema. Because I have, have, have never heard about uh, a character and a creator who were so uh, intertwined. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Having another actor play Coffin Joe is just having an actor play Coffin Joe. But, but you know, what Mojica was in a great extent in his life, he was Coffin Joe. And Coffin Joe was Mojica. And uh, uh, this kind of symbiosis between character and creator is very, very unique. And uh, I think this, this legacy shouldn't be tampered with. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, but, that's, but that's my opinion. You know, uh... makes sense. Also, his writing, a lot of the, the points of view are so very much of their era, specifically if you, if you go into things like gender politics, where the character would have to be very different today. It wouldn't make sense. Exactly, man. Don't go in there. <laughs> no, no. And, and it's funny because he had so much, he had deep respect for women. But when I first met him, that was one of the things that I was curious about too, because there is an element of, you know, certainly what reads as misogyny on a superficial level uh, when you first see those films. And then you realize he's trying to find the strongest woman in the world. And he's trying to find a woman stronger than even he is. And that that's his main, his main drive as a character. But yeah, I mean, today, I just, yeah, it does really feel like it's so much a reflection of its time and a commentary on its time that uh, it's hard to see what, what a modern day Coffin Joe character without Mojica would be. Exactly. And uh, well, it, it's a character, it, it would be a character out of time and it, it would be exposed to a lot of criticism that, you know, I think it's a cinema like, like the films of Ruggiero Deodato, you know, this kind of, this kind of cinema was practiced back there. It left a legacy behind. Some of the things that happened in these movies should not be repeated. You know, we, we are living a different uh, ethical age for filmmaking. Are we revolving? We have evolving. We have a lot to learn. So I really believe Coffin Joe doesn't belong in these times. 
But I don't know, maybe like in a comic book adaptation, he could live in other kinds of media, uh, uh, you know, and be resurrected in, in other stories, in other media, novels. I don't know. I, I think that's the, that would be the way to be, you know, to perpetuate Coffin Joe. Yeah. I mean, just, just making those films available to new generations of audiences and filmmakers will be, uh, you know, doing the Lord's work and in continuing the legacy. So it's an ad of clarified as comment, just a comment of clarity for you and Dennison. I thought Dennison would get that reference, the grave diggers and garbage workers of the world. It was a direct quote from Marins that he was being, when he was briefly in politics in relation to how Coffin Joe stood for the underdogs of Brazilian society. Very true, yes. Yeah, I'm reading, I'm reading the question. By the way, hello to, hello Donato, my man, how are you doing? Just a comment reply. I thought Jensen would get the reference, the grave diggers and garbage workers. Oh yeah, that, yeah, that was true. <laughs> yeah, Mojica had his stint in politics too. You know, he tried. Do you, do you want to speak to that a little bit because it's an interesting part of his history. Yeah, he ran for he ran for office here in the city council. I guess he would he would be like you know a city representative, but uh, was but he what wasn't elected. Oh no! <laughs> what, what era was it that he that he ran in again? But what there is this this cool T-shirt, man, that I saw a guy wearing at his funeral. That was his, you know, his ad for the for for campaign for, for office back in the early eighties. Okay, like, that's what it was. What was his campaign slogan? Uh, I don't remember. I think that you know that, that there was Coffin Joe. He said like a vote Zed Cachon and his number. But he used the character name? He ran under the character yeah, name? Yeah. I didn't know that part. You did. <laughs> That's wild. I mean, nobody would vote for Zed Cachon to run their city. <laughs> I mean, By the way, this was one of the reasons he wasn't elected. Because some of, some people of his acquaintance yeah. voted for José Mujica Marins. And some people voted for Café Joe. So far, vote of, against him. He split his own yeah, vote. <laughs> part of the votes had to be uh, uh, discarded because, yeah. like, oh, you have to vote for Zed Cachon. You, know? you have to vote for what was on the ballot. Yeah, that's yeah. too funny. That should be its own documentary. I'm not kidding. That could be a feature length doc. I, I mean, he was so camera oriented. He must have had people documenting some of this as it was happening. I mean, I know that he would have been shooting films, so even 16 would have cost a fortune, but I can't imagine there wasn't a small documentary crew getting at least like little moments of that campaign. It's too weird a thing. Like, a, and, and t public television in Brazil must have covered it extensively or no? I, well, I have no idea. I think, uh, uh, I, I, I even wonder if there, well, there was a, there were, there was a, a, a TV series, a, a biographical TV series uh, about like three years ago, right? Or four years yeah, ago? Yeah, by the way, uh, uh, Andrea Barsinski was one of the, the writers and producers of that. Mm. But I don't, I don't remember if the, uh, that was touched upon, you know, Mojica's candidacy for the city council. I mean, it's, it's a great side story in an already very, very unusual life. Oh, Fantastic. man. Do you, do you know what he ran on policy-wise? What was that? Do you know what policies he ran on? <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying to know everything now. Twice, one once in the early '80s, and in the early 2000s he ran again. And yeah. when he ran for the second time, I saw him on television announcing, advertising his candidacy, and he talked about you know he would be like a, 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 a city council man that he would would take care of the cultural affairs for the city. Beautiful. Okay, that's cool. So, just a minute. I, I really want to know more about this now. This is great. Um, oh, okay. Andre commented his campaign was really poor. Yeah, that was. <laughs> I still want to see every bit of footage that exists from both of the campaigns now. I can't believe it. Particularly that he ran into the character name. That's insane. That's beautiful. So, uh, so Barsinski is telling here that, that his, his motto campaign was, was really poor. was in defense of Gordon, but I didn't know that. What? Oh, hang on. Oh, he, I didn't see Andre's next comment. In, in the 80s, the motto was in defense of garbage men, grave diggers, and filmmakers. So that's exactly what Donato was quoting. Donato, how did you know that? That's amazing. I knew about him running, but but I didn't know any of the details like this. Anyway, it's fantastic. So 
Um, I'm not sure if there's if there are more questions, and that would be the time. Oh, Andrea says it's in my book, which I have to say I don't have yet. I'm going to order it. Andrea, is your book still in print? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, it's still in print. There is this very there is this great publishing company that came up in Brazil called Dark Side Books. Okay. And we're publishing a lot of very of incredible uh, titles, uh, horror titles. It's a horror specialized uh, publishing company. Uh, and uh, they, repu they reprinted, they republished uh, uh, Andres and uh, Ivan's uh, biography of Mujica, Maldito. Yes. Nice. I've got the old Ivan book, Ivan Perissimo. I still have that. Ivan gave me a copy in Sitges like back in, I think, 1998. Yeah, but, and, but for Mujica, no, I have no books at all. I'd love to get something from. And there is an appendix in the end in, in which uh, uh, they talked about the embodiment of evil, things that were not included uh, in the first biography. Wow, is it translated into English, or is there I, an English version? I don't think so. Andre, Andre could could answer that. Yeah, Andre, has it been translated? Because if not, I recommend hitting up Fat Press. I can totally see Harvey Fenton being into it, and it would be a beautiful book if he did it design one but anyways okay that's that's not for this talk but I, I if it's not available in english i would love to see that happen and i can try to facilitate i mean there's a number of people I can it's an amazing in. book man i i i'm rereading it uh now uh because i got the new dark side books edition but mm -hmm. i remember when the, the the first uh edition came uh, came up i read it in one night i couldn't stop reading. <laughs> such an entertaining narrative man it's a, such a beautiful story Fantastic. So I guess we should wrap it at this point. Um, do you want to talk a bit about what you're working on now as a closing beat, if you're able to? Well, right now I'm working on a number of television uh, television projects for the Global Network here in Brazil. The Global yeah. Network has been my house uh, for, for, for the last seven years. By the way, uh, the Night Shifter was produced by Global Network. Yeah, they were very supportive too. I remember when we launched it, they were very, very helpful. They, they were totally and uh, very happy with that. Uh, and, um, and also I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, finance uh, an independent project of mine, which is the adaptation of uh, this graphic novel, Lavagem, which is a very, very, very dark and fucked up, heretical uh, 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 horror story by this uh, uh, comic book artist called Chico from Brazilian Northeast. Mm. Uh, in a way, it's, it's, it's kind of a soulmate of uh, a love for mother only, uh, but in a feature format. Oh, great. Well, so, yeah, so that's what- Sign I'm, me up for that as soon as there's anything to see on it. I'm dying to see more. Let, then let's, let's, premiere, let's premiere it at home again. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, hopefully we'll have a physical festival again next year. Hopefully the world will stop being ridiculous. I mean, and I, I like it. This sounds like the right movie to show Bolsonaro what a moral cinema really can be. <laughs> you know? yeah. If he thinks like family melodramas are immoral, wait till he sees this movie from what you're telling me. <laughs> but, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. A, a, a lot, a, a lot, there is a lot to be said about the horrors of religion in Brazil more than ever. I know. So this, this story you know, accounts for a bunch of that, you know. Good. All right. Well, it was really, really great seeing you. I'm, I'm glad that you were able to do this with us. Very <laughs> thankful. I'm so happy you guys, you guys had me. I was, I'm so happy that I was able to share, you know, all my love uh, for Mojica and my stories with him. It was an honor, a very precious opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, there, there'll never be another artist like Mojica. Yeah, and long live oh, well. Asia, man. You guys were indestructible this year. <laughs> indestructible. I mean, the virtual festival is what it is, but I'm glad that we were able to do something meaningful still. You are going to, if you're indestructible this year, you're going to be indestructible forever. We <laughs> want to to everybody, to King, to Stephanie, to Daniel. <laughs> Daniel might be watching. <laughs> That's really sweet. Much love to you guys. Yeah, love from here too. Stay safe out there. You too. You too. Stay safe. I'll see you guys next year. All right. Talk soon. Talk soon.